Lisa Svensson is the United Nations Oceans Chief. She says that governments, firms and people must act more quickly to halt plastic pollution. This is a planetary crisis, she insists, and in a few short decades since we discovered the convenience of plastic, we're ruining the ecosystem of the ocean. She was speaking ahead of a United Nations Environment Summit in Nairobi, and she's backing a resolution by Norway for the world to completely eradicate plastic waste in the ocean. If all the nations agree to that long-term goal, it'll be considered a UN success. And it certainly it sounds more ambitious than the current commitment to substantially decrease waste inputs into the sea by 2025. Ms. Svensson admitted that the United Nations process is slow and it could take 10 years to get a UN treaty agreed on plastic litter and a further two years to get it implemented. And she said, we've to progress through the UN because this is a truly global problem, but we can't wait that long. We need much stronger actions from civil society, putting pressure on business to change. They can switch their supply chains very fast. And we need more individual governments to take urgent action too. A new powerful influence in public opinion has recently come into the debate, and that's what's now called the Attenborough Effect. David Attenborough's final edition of the Blue Planet 2 series focused with compelling and disturbing images on the damage plastics inflicting on the world's wildlife, and this programme is seen worldwide. Well, the pressure is mounting, but in the meanwhile, what do we do, and what part can Tinwell play? The effect of the problem on the Manx shoreline and rivers was identified way back and 12 years ago the Beach Buddies was founded and it's a charity with the main aim of cleaning and keeping clean our beaches and rivers. It's grown from a few dedicated helpers to thousands of volunteers giving their time to collect the marine rubbish. The work of the founder Bill Dale was acknowledged in this year's New Year's Honours list when he was awarded the British Empire Medal in recognition of his work. The task of the FIM Capital Beach Buddies, as it's just now called, goes on and no doubt there will be a lot to do after this latest bad weather. Recently he opened the home front to another battle, as he asked us to join the Manx War Against Plastic. Well today, to talk about the work of the Beach Buddies and to discuss the wider implications of plastic pollution and what we should do about it and how the Isle of Man, even as a small player, can make a big impression. We welcome as our studio guest, Bill Dale B. Um, thank you for coming out today, Bill. Thank you for inviting me, Roger. Yeah, so you're not on the beaches this morning, then? No, or, no yesterday. Um, and I think it was a pretty good decision taken on uh, <laughs> Thursday, Friday night. And uh, it looked pretty rough and it's been pretty bad for a couple of days, yeah. yeah right. Now, you founded this in October 2006. Yes. Why? Walking the dogs on the beach. Um, this was in Kurt Michael area and human beings go to the water dogs are more interested in things that they can find to play with and they started picking up plastic bottles from the high water mark and we went up to the high water mark and uh, and realized that there was lots lots of plastic to be picked up because when you looked around the corner it was stretching for miles and miles mm -hmm. so the next weekend went down there just two of us and we took some bags and a litter picker and some gloves very simple you know five quids worth of stuff and started filling bags and for six weeks we went down in, in succession and picked up 30,000 bottles and that was in Kurt Michael Balaf area. You've been there and some time on I presume. Some you? of them have been there a very long time um, 30 years some of them right. um, so that means pretty much since the invention of the plastic bottle um, and some of them were buried very deeply in the ground and had clearly been there a long time because when you pick them up, they're crumbling into smaller pieces of plastic, which is the big problem in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it went from there. I ran it on my own for a long time and then realized that you can't do these things on your own. And in 2012, 13, I launched a very simple Facebook page, asked if people would like to get involved. And first event was held in Castletown and 35 people turned up. And I thought, wow, this is great, you know. So I ran one in the north the next weekend and 40 turned up. So I had 75 mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, how wonderful it would be if say you ended up with a couple of hundred volunteers. And by the end of that first year, I had 1500. And then companies wanted to get involved in schools and the current figure stands at 8,840. These um, are, they sign up in some way, do they? 
No, I, I've kept it as simple as possible. You don't have to give your name. Uh, there's no signing up. You just turn up if you want to. There's nobody keeping account. There's nobody checking whether you're going to be there or not. It's a very informal thing, and I think it's worked because it's simple. Now, what sort of people do this? Is it across the board, a different ages, different types of occupation, or is it a particular type of person who's keen on Absolutely this? across the board. We've had a, one guy came along with a... With a, a 12, 15 day old baby one time is in the summer, of course, you wouldn't do it on a day like this. Mm. Um, we get lots of people, families are the, are the, uh, are the key to this because the, the, as this has gone along, the thing that you do identify is that this is all hopeless unless we break this chain. And if you can get families and children along, then that makes a big difference. And, and running education programs in the schools has been the single most important thing that we've done. In the, and that's only been for the last 12 months. But that has been really engaging with the kids. And we've got to hope that they're the ones who are going to break the chain in the future. Yeah, but it registers, doesn't it, with young people? I've got grandchildren and so on who I'm surprised at their age how much they actually understand about this. They do. And I think a lot of that is down to, uh, if, if you think about it, the age of teachers now is sort of between the mid-20s and, you know, on average, mid-20s and 40, say. And I think that generation has grown up understanding that we've made a mess of things. Um, certainly when I talk to the teachers, they, they couldn't be more enthusiastic. So you get a nice f uh, feedback from them and then you go and talk to the kids and I, and I show them pictures and I don't pull any punches. We're showing some pretty horrible pictures of animals dying, you know, wh big whales and all sorts of animals dying and animals that's been damaged by, you know, losing their feet and all sorts of things, birds and stuff like that. And when you look on the front row, some of the kids are a bit shocked, to be quite honest. And the very first time I gave this was at Russian primary school. And some of the children on the front row were in tears. And afterwards, I said to the teacher, do you think I went a bit over the top there? And he said, absolutely not. He says, you've got to t tell them the truth. And I have to say, since then, uh, the response to the presentations that I give at school has been fantastic. The kids are just wonderful. And I've got a great hope for the future because of that. And do they turn out to help? Yes. The, well, the, the question I always ask at the end of the presentation is, please put your hand up if you'd like to come cleaning the beaches with beach buddies. And, of course, every single person wants to do that. And uh, we've had... A co two or three thousand, a couple of thousand kids on the beach in the last 12 months. And in this next 12 months, we've got a lot of others planned and some other events as well, which we can talk about a bit later. But going, bringing people out to do this job, some yes. of it is probably a mucky job when you think of some of the things that get washed up. Um, when, with young people in particular, you have immediately... Uh, uh, an issue of care, don't you, or responsibility of care? Absolutely. You know, we, we have uh, public liability insurance and we have risk assessments and things like that. So the schools always ask for those sort of things because you've got to do that in this day and age. But the one thing we always do with anybody who turns up, and this happened even last weekend, you have to give what we call a safety talk, which t warns people about the sort of things you can find. Now, to be honest, most of it's tin cans and bottles and plastics and fish boxes and bits of nets and ropes. But, of course, in amongst that, you'll find a fishing line with hooks in it you might find a hypodermic syringe. Now, that's not uncommon, but um, we do find them now and again. Um, and you've got to warn children in particular not to touch these things and broken glass and stuff like that. Mm. And we don't send little kids on a beach on their own. That never happens. You always have to have a supervised by an adult or a friend or whatever. Um, and we've never had in all of the time uh, and all of these beach cleaning sessions, we've never had one single incident because I think we were sensible about giving the warning. So when people turn up, you talk about picking gadgets to pick the stuff. Yeah, up little, little so pickers. Yeah. Yes, and gloves and yes. things like do people have to provide their own, or when they turn up, do you issue them with them? We provide those. Um, we're very lucky that now and again we get these things sponsored. I have to say that small gloves are the consistent <laughs> continuing problem because little gloves for kids are expensive. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do when somebody sends an email or a, or a, or a message on text or whatever that they're going to come, if they're going to bring kids, and I always ask them if they could bring small gloves for their children. Um, but we do have small gloves, and, and if we're running school events, then we make sure that we've got enough uh, in hand so that uh, everybody... But you, that is the number one rule. You must wear a pair of gloves. So you gather all this stuff up off yep. whatever beach that you're on. Yeah. What do you do with it? That's the, you know what? That's the most common question. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, we recycle as much as we can. Um, we recycle tin cans, plastic bottles... Uh, glass bottles, hard plastics, which is things like fish boxes and buckets, and metal, because we find 
it's quite substantial chunks of metal. Mm -hmm. And then everything else we take to the energy from waste plant, where we're very fortunate to have a very good relationship with the uh, the owners, Suez, down there. And everything then goes to the incinerator and is burned and makes electricity. So um, the amount of landfill that comes out of our collection is absolutely minimal. Very, very small amount at all. And as I say, we recycle as much as we can. So we're trying to be as green as we possibly can. So do you sort all this before it ever gets anywhere? Do you put them in bags or do you do it yeah, later? We, we sort it as it comes off the beach. The, the volunteers throw their, empty their bags into a bigger bag, a much bigger bag. As it goes in, we take out the plastic bottles and, and tin cans and, and glass bottles at that point. And then when we go to the um, the recycling areas, you know, the immunity sites, it's already bagged up and ready to just tip it in. But well, by the look of it, it's a never-ending task, isn't it? Just, yes. Just, just looking at the rough weather we've had now, yes. you've got quite a, something facing you the next Yeah, even, even I looked at Douglas this morning <laughs> as I drove along, and uh, there's a big job in Douglas, and that's normally not, not very badly hit. Easterly wind, of course, has been very, is very unusual. Um, and on the West Coast, it's not so badly hit. But I was at, also at Castletown yesterday, and there's lots there as well. So we've, we've got a, a few good weeks of work coming up. Right. Well, how do you fund all this? Okay, um, from the beginning, I funded it on my own. Um, it wasn't very easy for obvious reasons. Um, I, I already had a vehicle and a trailer, um, and then when that expired, I bought another one. But in reality, you can't keep going like that. So when we got to 2012, 13, and more people were coming along, we were getting some small donations from companies, and then we realized that you have to do something more sensible about that. So in 2014, we created a charity, um, and we've then been able to officially raise funds. And that that's, uh, making that decision alone changed things because people think, you know, we're not giving the money to Bill Dale. If, obviously, they weren't, but they were, there's a, you know, a suspicion mm -hmm. that perhaps among some people they were giving the money to me, whereas now it's a charity and it goes to into a pot and then we're able to pay for things. And we've been very fortunate. A couple of companies have been very good to us. Um, AFD Software gave us a big truck 14 and a half thousand quid in 2014 which was a fantastic uh, that changed everything and very recently as you've just mentioned before we've got FIM Capital who've come on as a headline sponsor that's the first time that's ever happened and that's very new news so that's only just happened and our charity obviously has only been around nearly coming up to four years so it's a very sm young and a very small charity our turnover is not very big but um, we've we've been we've had a good response and I know that companies nowadays they when it comes to making a donation to charity they ignore I, and I've been told this many times they ignore begging letters and we don't send them out uh, the staff are actually choosing who is the recipient of a donation these days and lots of the staff come along to our events and so we, we are featured quite often which is very nice but local authorities uh, when you look at the work that you're doing yes. you could argue that it's you're probably doing some of the work that the local authority should have got stuck into a long time ago. We are doing all of the work that the local authority should be doing. Now, that that's not a criticism of the local authorities. There simply isn't the money around. And and a one thing you have to realise, too, is if somebody was to set up on the scale that we've got now as an official government body, you would be talking hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. I mean, just in equipment alone... I would have thought, you know, they'd probably be looking at investing in £100,000 worth of gear. You know, these big wagons that come in empty bins, it'd be enormous cost. So, yeah, you're right. Um, local authority probably should be doing it. Government should be doing it. But it's a huge, huge job, you know. And when, when you analyse the rubbish that we find on the beach, 80% of it is not from the Isle of Man. It's but coming it, but from it's elsewhere. causing us problems. It is causing us problems. And mm. and we realise that, you know, I mean, economic situation around the world is not good. So we thought, you know, we would just do something which would be good for the community. And it's captured the imagination. And I have to say, I have met some fantastic people this last six, five, six years. It's just... It makes it gives you and, and renews your faith in the human race. The, the, am I right? The, the local authorities, like say Douglas Corporation, are yes. responsible actually for the land and its condition down to the low water mark. I think it, it's to what they call the median, median is it? yeah, which is halfway between high, high and low, low water. Right. Yeah, I, I mean I do understand that. And Douglas Corporation, as you know, spend a lot of money shifting the seaweed around. Um, 
and I th- and they do have guys who pick stuff up on the beach, but it's um, it's it's an expensive thing because it's very manual, you know. And if you if they were to put out, say, for instance, you know, we had eighty odd volunteers last week. If you had and and it takes that many to clear the beach, if they paid say 40 people you know they'd be there for days on end i mean how much money is involved in that you know you, and, and all of the kits and uh, you know mm-hmm. insurance and all these things early february the douglas themselves released a press release to say that they're going to be working in cooperation with you they are and to be honest douglas corporation and and most of the local authorities have been fantastic but this this initiative is really good because this is not just about beaches because we've said all along that we would like to expand what we do because if you think about it, if you throw a piece of rubbish in the street anywhere in the Isle of Man, say in the middle of the Isle of Man in Crosby, if it if it goes into the street, it will go down the drain and then in a stream, in a river, out to sea and on the beach. Mm-hmm. So if we stop all this at source and if we can educate the children in particular, and that's, that's the initiative with Douglas Corporation and we've got Friends of the Earth involved um, and the local authorities, but in particular Douglas Corporation, and what we're going to do is go to schools on a Friday afternoon um, give them some kit and and allow them to go and clean up around their own schools, around the perimeter of the playground. And then the following day, they'll go home with a leaflet that evening and the following day, come back with their parents and then we'll give out kit again and then we'll encourage them to go and clean up wherever they like. And hopefully it'll be their own streets, parks, anywhere around that there's of their own, which they really care about. Come back with their, with their rubbish after an hour and then we'll see what the results are. And that's gonna, the first two places it's gonna happen is Manor Park School and Anacor. So in theory, we should be able to clean up the whole of Pull Rose and Anacor at the end of, of one weekend, which is at the 23rd, 24th of March. And I've got, I think this is gonna be really good. And, and I could not have had more help from Douglas Corporation. Well, you've got an anonymous text already coming oh, this I? morning. <laughs> <laughs> I which, hope it's a kind one. Well, it is actually, it's okay. just, well done, Bill. Well done, Beach Buddies. Right, so well, that's nice. Yeah, nice. We, we do get lots of nice people saying lots yeah. of nice things, yeah. Right. Now, but you're spreading the gospel. I find it interesting to see I've been reading newspaper reports um, from other parts, literally from other parts uh, of Britain, the Suffolk coast, for instance, has yes. shown an interest in it. Yes. And you ended up lecturing in America. I did. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of social media um, because it can become so personal and very nasty and people seem to think that they can say whatever they like you know and I, I really don't like that but in terms of what what it's done for us as a community in, uh, involvement as a community group then it couldn't have been better to be quite honest and that's where people have picked up on us um, we've had a, a group of beach cleaners from Hawaii have been following us for something in the region of five years and we keep promising we're going to go out there and they've arranged for me to go and speak at a university there. Um, and and a, lot, a lot of people on our Facebook page know about those guys, but then something special happened in 2016. A group of geologists from Ohio University came to the Isle of Man and wanted to obviously research the geology, which another subject entirely, the Isle of Man's geology is absolutely staggering. They believe it's it's on a par with the best in the world. Anyway, that's another story, but um, they said they'd like to come beach cleaning because they were at Scarlet looking at all of the fossils and things down there. And then when they found out about that, they really got into it. They thought it was fantastic. They've never seen anything like it. So um, they invited me. Would I do a FaceTime broadcast to their their one of their mm. monthly meetings? And one of the dates that they gave me was my birthday, and I thought, you know, what the hell, I'm going to go. So I did, and I went on my birthday so last where, where year. Is this Youngstown State? Youngstown. Where is it? Did you say? In Ohio. Ohio. Not far right. from not far from Cleveland, so Mich- so. Michigan, just below the lakes. Yeah, it's a Manx community. There, there, there is a big Manx community. They knew lots about the Isle of Man. Yeah, and then on the back of that, once once I'd made that announcement on Facebook, next thing I was picked up in California, and I was invited there, and I went down to Cliff, uh, Clint Eastwood country and spoke at uh, the University of Monterey in California. And then I was invited to Washington, D.C. to meet a senior ex-Navy uh, rear admiral who runs a, an organization called the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which is, if you Google that, it is an amazing thing. And they're going to give us some space on their, on their um, website. And then, of course, the UNESCO Biosphere thing happened. 
and Dr. Han Chun Lee specifically mentioned Beach Buddies when that was handed over in 2016. And all of a sudden, this little beach cleaning <laughs> group has started me walking dogs. This is how, like going around America. <laughs> what I find is interesting is that it's, it, I'm, please don't, so I'm not taking away from any of this, but it is in concept quite a simple one. Yes. And I can't understand why, with such an intense problem on beaches throughout the world, others haven't got round to doing it. You know, I feel exactly the same. And I've been writing to the BBC and ITV and all of these companies and governments and all sorts, and not one of them has sent a reply. Not one of them. And purely because we have found... It's not It's not rocket science. And beach cleaning is not new anywhere. But on the scale that we've got it running, it is unprecedented. And what we're trying to show people is that actually if a group of people just simply get together and start something, you could do exactly what we've done. And we've only got 84,000 people, but we've got more than 10% of the population. And a lot of beaches, if you look at it. We have got a lot of beaches, place. yeah. And I think Take islands are yeah. islands are good at doing this as well. And we've got a, something starting with some islands as well. Since the environment ministers came over a few weeks ago, we're setting up an alliance where they're going to go away and they've looked at what we're doing. They're going to go away and do the same. And then in a year's time, you know, we'll have a, a joined, a coordinated voice which will have some impact and, and then go and speak to the big governments and say, if we can do it, you guys can do now, it as well. We always hear the phrase flotsam and jetsam. In fact, it used to be a music hall act. Yes. <laughs> um, but it, the two different types of marine debris there. Yes. And as I understand it, flotsam is something that's not deliberately thrown overboard. It's from a shipwreck or something. Yes. And jetsam is something that's being choked. Deliberately, over, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And flotsam, it still belongs to the original owner and could claim it back. You, uh, well, in theory, I mean, if I found a plastic bottle which had many, many uh, banknotes in it, I imagine if somebody could identify it, then they would want to have it back. But um, yeah, but I mean, honestly, we find some, if we find something of value. I have found in the t 11, 12 years, I have found some banknotes, but the total is something in the region, I think, of 40 pounds and 33 pence. So it's not going to make me a fortune. So they've not found an old master wrapped up in polythene then? No, <laughs> no not yet. No, no. Not yet. <laughs> Although I'll tell you the other thing we found, uh, and I didn't know what it was at the time, but a, a couple of years ago I found some ambergris, which is oh, yeah. whale vomit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's apparently ex an extremely expensive piece of um, stuff that they use in the perfume industry. And I just threw it in, you know, into the skip to go to the energy from waste plant. And by all accounts, and I'm, this is the first time I've told anybody, it's worth about 20,000 quid. Ouch. And I, I, I've only, I only found out about that a few years afterwards. Right. So, uh, and what the a shame. nobody picked it up on the way there. No, oh, but no. apparently a, a piece about the size of a small football is worth about 5,000 pounds. Really? That's yeah, amazing. It's amazing. That's amazing yeah. Now, well, that's that's fine. So, in other words, you really, in all of this, haven't yet found anything that you could take away and put on uh, some sort of auction then or something like that. The one thing that I have found over the years, some lovely pieces of sea glass and driftwood, which I go away and make things, and we raise yeah. some little bits of money on that. And I've, and I've actually built a shed in my garden out of driftwood, which is, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. Well, now, that, that we're talking about those sort of things, and we've been focusing mainly on plastic in the conversation. Yes. But we must be a lot of other things turn up, and fishnets, and fishnets. Boy, well, all sorts of other stuff other than bottles. Yeah, and uh, I'm asked this question quite a lot by our own volunteers, is, you know, why is there so much fishing gear? You know, now, mm. I, I, you can see from a lot of it that it's just, it's gone over the side, not, you know, accidentally. Um, having said that... There are lots of bits which you can tell have been cut off the ends of bits of uh, th things. For instance, when the guys repair, repair lobster pots, it's made out of like a, a, the, the net that they use in a lobster pot is like a green twine. And we find so many pieces cut off which are only about three or four inches long that that is deliberate. Um, and it breaks down, of course, you know, and then it gets into the, into mm. the food chain. So, uh, you know, the fishermen, I think, I think should could be a lot better the other thing that they are definitely guilty of is throwing over a comp uh, 25 liter used oil drums okay with oil in them and in 2016 we found 67 of these now if you'd found three or four it was an accident you know it could have got yeah. washed over the side 67 is not an accident and last year, the number went down. I think it's probably, and I can't remember exactly, but I, rem I do remember the 67 figure. Last year, I think it was about 30. This year so far, I've found something in the region of eight or nine in the first couple of months. But, but you the, know, old, the old still sealed in them. 
they're sealed in. One, in fact, had a piece of rope tied on it and a huge big chunk of metal to sink it to the bottom. Now, I don't understand that because they're polluting their own environment. Mm. What, what is, you know, I don't understand. And the other thing is they can take it back to port and recycle it free of charge. Do you ever get any um, radioactive material turning up? Not, nothing like, no, no. Mm. We found the occasional completely shot flare that sort of thing but we've never found anything that well, needs and, uh, and what about ammunition at arms because there's thousands upon thousands of tons of ammunition there are the two I, were not very far from our shores one guy phoned once to say he'd found what he thought was a piece of old munitions but it was rusty and gone you know it was it was completely shot but i have to say it, so far we've never we've never found anything like that Beaufort's dyke i was having a look at it which is only six miles off scotland and not that far of the isle of man that's right yeah it's, maybe after these storms then Again, it was an easterly storm, so maybe they've all gone to Ireland. Recently described as UK's undersea ticking time bomb. Really? Well, some of the things are so old I suppose now they've just started to deteriorate. Yeah, I suppose. I, let's face it, it's we're going to find... Um, I'm not surprised by anything we find anymore. Um, we're going to find everything one day, and you know, over a period of time we will find. And I hope you don't find some of the things up there because there's nerve gases and all sorts up there. Oh, really? Okay, mm. right. Well, I'll be careful next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, okay. Well, th there we are. But with all this work and all this going on, Bill, at the start of this year, you received an award in the New Year's Honours List. It was last year, actually. It was last year. Yeah, Sorry, I thought it was this year. No, it was right, 2000, no. Uh, January 2017. Right. So, right, okay. Uh, it yeah. was, yeah. And, it was, and I have to say, it was a massive surprise. But when I, when I look at it, and, and we've had some other awards locally, um, every one of them is a reflection of what the volunteers are all about, you know. And I just think that it's, it's something that we should all share. If you think about it, if I was the only person in the Isle of Man out cleaning beaches on my own, I would be considered to be like the local nutcase, you know, the eccentric nutcase who's out there wasting his life, clearing up plastic and it'll never end. But because we've got 8,800 volunteers, it takes on a whole different aspect, you know, and it shows that it's actually touched the community. And I know that on top of that, there's thousands and thousands of people. There'll be people out there, even in this weather today, who will be out walking their dogs or whatever they're doing, just going for a walk. And they're all in the spirit of it because they're all taking bags with them and they're all filling up our bins. And our bins are uh, no, filling no, like never before. When you said bins, how many of you? You've got quite a few around 38. Now, right. And they... Pretty much every beach you go to in the Isle of Man, you, you can't go to the beach without walking past one, which means, you you know, one day you're going to take one of the bags from the side, fill it up, and that's what's happening. And, and our bins are filling twice as fast as they used to. All right. Well, Bill, we take a commercial break now. So to all of you Thank listening, you. join us again in just about three minutes. Bill Dale, BEM, the founder of Beach Buddies, is our studio guest. And in today's programme, we're talking about the work of his organisation, and also, we're going to get round to the wider issue of world plastic pollution. Now, if you'd like to join in this discussion, then join us, because we'll be back after the news at quarter past one on the Manning Line. Now, Bill, you've, um, you're the editor, you're publisher of some magazines around the island, uh, yes. the, the various uh, chronicles. Yes. And I notice I got one here, which is the Southern Chronicle, for this year, and there's a big headline. I mean, you couldn't, could, couldn't get more noticeable you know white type on a black background yeah. reverse type that says join the manx war against plastic now how do we do that because it's often thought that because of the size of this place we're not going to make much difference to all this no and uh, and i do understand that and i have to say for quite some time i've felt that you know that this is not a losing battle but it's a very slow burner you know and it's and, and it takes such a long time for things to happen but this, as you mentioned at the very start of the program, this, this influence by David Attenborough has changed everything. Mm. Since November, when that started to go out, and he, even though he hadn't mentioned plastic in the first few uh, editions, it was clearly leading up to, to him doing that. And when he said that in the final version, and then all sorts of things has just taken off since then. And everybody, I mean, the national press in the UK was taken next to no notice of this. And then all of a sudden, in November, December, January, everybody now is on the bandwagon. And it's a huge campaign now. It's changed dramatically. But when when you say on a, a campaign, we have a part to play in it here in the Isle of Man. Yes, yes. Right, so what part can we play? Is it, is it an individual's part? Or should Tinwell be doing more? Or is it doing more? I think this is where 
community and government is coming together. And in fact, that is and has been happening. And to be fair to Tynwald, I've been speaking in private to members of Tynwald since probably the end of last summer, well before the David Attenborough thing, about making changes and talking about uh, issues like uh, reusable plastic bottles, refilling plastic bottles in water taps, uh, getting rid of plastic where we can, using compostable materials instead of um, polystyrene and plastic for fast food containers, um, and making some changes. And I think government's trying to get uh, um, companies and individuals to change without the need to go through all the mess of legislation and to actually and, and that is starting to happen and i mean there's a list of people now and companies even shop right now have started uh, they're going to get rid of single-use plastic bags the one thing about it all is at the end of the day plastic is is a useful material it's the the disposal of it is what's causing the problem because and, and as with anything in the world, it is a small percentage of the population who are messing things up for everybody else. And I drive from, and I live in Andreas, and I drive over the mountain a lot. And the stuff at the side of the road is things like fast food containers, coffee cups, polystyrene boxes, pizza trays. It needs to be whizzed out the window. Whizzed out the window at night time. Because you can imagine for years, I've been, look, I've been trying to find somebody, to, and poor, some poor soul, to make an example of. So they take them to court and, and the court can say, you are fine, mate, a thousand quid because you threw a pizza carton out through the There is a legis legislation currently to allow for that. That, that you, can, you can be fined quite a lot of money for, uh, for deliberately um, throwing litter out of a window, yeah. Mm. But I tell you what, in a, in a four or five years I've been trying to do that, I have not seen one single incident. And, I think, and, and as I say, in the morning you can see what's been thrown out the night before. So it's not the easiest thing to find. So therefore, if the materials they throw out the window, which they're going to continue throwing out the window, are not made of plastic, then you're making a difference. Whereas plastic itself is a pretty useful uh, material if it's disposed of properly or recycled. What about our rivers and waterways? We haven't touched on that yet because we've been talking about beaches and marine pollution. But I presume that if things end up in our rivers, and I presume that they do, uh, and as you say, possibly end up in the sea afterwards, but yeah. that's homegrown. Yeah, I've been asked by some of the anglers and, and some of those organisations to get involved in cleaning up some pretty messy rivers. And we're, that's part, because we've said we're going to do things other than beaches, then the the rivers are obviously one place that we'll, we will have a go at. Um, honestly, this is endless, isn't it? I mean, you could cover the whole of the Isle of Man, and why not? You know, here we are in control of this place, 33 miles by 12. Why why can we not do that and, and set an example? And more to the point, if we work together, you know, don't look on the government or the authorities as the enemy. Look at those the people who can help us and work together. And that has worked for us. And without question, you will get things done on that basis. Whereas if you go in with all guns firing and say, you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, I tell you what, you will in instantly end up with enemies. And that, do that doesn't work. So well, Legislation is normally, or should be, are brought about to legislate for the minority, not the majority. I mean, I we all know you don't murder people, but there's a law against it. Yeah, and I think if they were to say that anybody who was found throwing rubbish out through their car window and, th and, th and dumping rubbish or fly tipping or whatever, if yeah. those fines were to be really, really high, very, very high, then they would think twice maybe because sure, there's, yeah. there's idiots going around the corner here and throwing televisions over the side of Marine Drive. The but, last time but, we were there, well, we found half a dozen televisions. But this is not just uh, economic, is it? It's an attitude of mind. It is. I mean, you think about it. I think it costs about seven or eight quid to get rid of a TV. You know, you'd probably use that much petrol going up there. But if you got fat, if you got caught, and the other thing is, on one of these televisions, there was the um, the barcode was still on, and I went to the I went to Walton's, and they they told me. I, we know who bought this television. Now, we didn't do anything about it. This is several years ago. We mm. didn't do anything about it at the time. But people should be aware that you uh, are able, you know, if it had been stolen, the police are able to identify lots of these things these days. So people should be aware that if you do things like that, look out, because the boys in blue might well be knocking on your door very shortly. Do we still get old prams and things in the river? Yeah, and sh shopping baskets, is, shopping trolleys are not uncommon. Right. Um, general plastic tin cans, but uh, I've seen quite a few shopping trolleys in rivers. I don't know what goes through people's oh, heads, no. but 
you know, it happens. Well, it's interesting we talk about pollution at sea, but there's now a, a recent research, I see, that's been looking in Europe because they've got a lot bigger lakes than we've got, and they're finding that lakes like Lake Garda, the level of plastic pollution is similar to those in the marine environment. That's right, yeah, and it's because it breaks down. Mm. Um, th- this this gyre that they talk about, which pe- everybody will have heard about in the in the Pacific, which is apparently twice the size of Texas, which has billions and billions of pieces of plastic, it's not tin cans and and bottles. I mean, there are some in there and bits of fishing gear, but most of it is little bits which have broken down because when it gets wet and dry and and, and exposed to the sun, it crumbles eventually into small pieces, and it's like a huge soup, which floating on the on the top cup two or three feet of the water. Um, and nobody knows what to do about it. But obviously, it's going to happen in lakes because, again, this system of if you dump something, it goes in the river, it ends up in mm. w- the final destination where the river comes out. Well, they're worried, particularly in freshwater rivers, about this stuff getting into the food chain. Exactly. Because it's in tiny particles. Even, it turns out, plastic micro pieces Microplastics. in your toothpaste. That's right. Um, and, and I know that the UK government, certainly Scottish government, are, are banning these things because this tiny little bit... I mean, it, it, isn't it disgraceful that these companies are able to do these things and surreptitiously slide these things into things like toothpaste? I mean, it is disgraceful, really. What on earth are they thinking about? Because it's all about money. And I'll tell you, one of the things that's going to solve this problem of of plastic and junk and stuff everywhere in the oceans and the rivers is if somebody comes up with a clever idea of making money out of it. Because while you're just doing it for the community, until the big boys are on, are able to make any serious money out of it, it's not going to happen. So I think that is the answer to this problem. Now, we, we started off talking about plastic bottles because that does seem to be the single biggest problem wherever you go and a significant part of your collection uh, so but what do you do about that problem it's not just our problem it's a universal problem you, you say that you see some things there that have been there when you first started this 30 years were you able to identify where their original source might have been yes chiefly because it says irish milk come from dublin <laughs> and stuff like that yeah. and we were finding things from canada i mean you know we're if you think about the prevailing wind in the atlantic is sort of southwest coming up the up the ocean so we were finding things from canada Look, most of them you can't identify because the labels have all gone and but you can tell that they're very very old but you know one of the things that we talk about and and we have lots of conversations as you can imagine on the beaches is why don't we reintroduce a deposit on plastic bottles and tin cans the same way as we used to do when I was a kid with glass bottles and if that happened you could have the world's children running down to the beaches tomorrow running around collecting plastic bottles to get five pence each because they already do it in Europe in uh, outside supermarkets, you can put these things into a, a, a special little hole in the wall, and it comes out with a voucher you can spend inside the supermarket. Well, so I why can't we do that? Well, I think as far as I know, that's called reverse vending, isn't it? I think it is. Yeah, that's where they they take the bottles into a machine, it crushes them, and returns a deposit to the yes to the customer. Yes. And then, well, there's a surcharge on the bottle though when it's bought. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the same thing in yeah. reverse, yeah. yeah. Right, right. But uh, aren't deposit return schemes being worked on now, including Scotland? In what, sorry? Scotland. Scotland are doing something along those lines. Um, it, it's In Scandinavia, it's been around for a very long time. Mm. So why not, you know, and, and as always, we're quite slow to follow things. You know, Britain is quite often slow to follow the rest of the world. But there's a piece of technology that clearly exists. We don't have to invent it. It's not crazy expensive by all accounts. And in fact, it's clever enough to, to identify different types of plastic as you put them in. So it's not just bottles, you know, all sorts of different types of plastic. And then it separates them and they go off to be recycled for all, you know, obviously for all the right reasons. Well, when you look at this, you find that, as you say, it's almost become fashionable suddenly. Yes. You find some of these multiple chains, like pret a the restaurant people, yes. they're going to roll out a bottle back cash scheme, apparently, quite yes. b- very soon. And um, there's a say, Scandinavia's been doing this for ages. But, you know, you go back to glass bottles. Now, well, I can remember taking pop bottles back that are downwards and quattro years ago. Yes, me ago. too. Yes. yes. But wh- I noticed recently the, in a, Granada program that you were on, a chap from the milk marketing place said that uh, much as they're hoping to cut down plastic use, uh, getting glass bottles and cleaning them again is a difficult thing. 
It is, yeah, and apparently I, I can understand that too because uh, you know the hygiene rules are slightly different these days than when you and I were children. Mm. <laughs> um, but you know I do understand that as well. But having said that, most of the glass which is recycled is not recycled to be used again as a bottle. It is crushed and used in aggregates and things. So mm. it's the material itself is 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 recycled, not so much the bottle itself. Yeah. But we've been talking a lot of the fashionable things at the moment is talking about the use of plastic straws. Billions of them have been used. Yes. Over the when you get a little straw, you don't really think much about that, do you? No, but you don't. But I mean, the, the thing is that, that there are alternatives available. I mean, they might be slightly more expensive, but I, there's, a, there's a restaurant chain in the Isle of Man which runs uh, 14 North and Little yeah. Fish. And I think he's got Bath and Bottle Bar, and he's just taking all of the plastic straws out for obvious reasons, because these things get dumped and they cause damage. So if you've got a, a wheat-based biodegradable straw or packaging, I think Manvend are putting out um, cups and, so, and, and uh, packaging, food packaging, which you could have a fast food containers instead of the plastic that we get or, or polystyrene now. I mean, if if we all start to think differently and say to these outlets, you know, why don't you have compostable recyclable or or items which do not damage the environment then we can change things you know it's it's, it's a little island why can't we can do these things well no we were going to do this program today of course focus is the mind yes so this morning i opened uh, i had a look around our kitchen all oh, right to see what we'd got and we've got tomatoes in on a plastic tray with a plastic coating to them We've got yogurt pots in the fridge. Yes. Um, we've even got uh, uh, buns in a plastic That's right. container. Uh, it, uh, there's so many of these things, and I'm, I've sort of started to think on about where we have seen plastic cutlery. Yes. Um, cotton waste. I was surprised to discover, looking at the at the list of things which were supposed to be uh, dangerous, uh, and had plastic involved in them, cigarette butts. Uh, yes, the filter filter yeah. is made from plastic and it's it's very very fine yeah that's right right and i one thing which i um you know, with all of this which i really did strike home was apparently pg tips are about to switch to fully biodegradable plant-based tea bags the current ones are sealed with polypropylene that's right that's you right i know and you don't bag. even know about these things and there'll be a few more surprises coming along the line as well i'm sure but it, it's it is amazing how people have somehow just sort of embraced all of this and it just continues to happen and uh, people are not thinking about where they're going but again this is led by the commercial sector so they need convincing as well yet bread you know when you think about it not, um uh, and various other things used to come, just, just vegetables, for instance, used to come in a paper bag. Well, in America, of course, with, with me visiting in America in the autumn, everywhere you go to, they don't give you plastic bags at all. Everything comes in a paper bag. So there's another, you know, that's where they are ahead of us. I tell you what, it's the only place they're ahead of us because they're not doing as much as we are mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. They recycle pretty well. But um, the the amount of junk that's at the side of the roads and all the way through everywhere I went in America was just appalling, appalling. I was very very surprised, very disappointed. Well, I've been on American roads which look like something out of a thirties or forties film, where there's all sorts of telegraph poles and wires and things all the way down, and as you say, junk all along the side on of the, the roads. Curbside. Terrible. Yeah. They don't know what to do about it. Yeah, and I mean that is the it's the origin, if you think about, of the throwaway society. So they've got to get their act together, big style. Well, I'd like to talk about our plans, UK plans, a variety of other things, Bill, but we're not too far off the end of this uh, programme at the moment. And as I said earlier on, I hope I was right, you'll be joining us on the Manning Yeah, line. absolutely. Yeah, it'd be very, very good. Thanks. Well, there's, there's one question I think we've just got time maybe to quickly do, and that is when we gather all this stuff like you do together and you send it off for recycling and so on, there's a cost factor involved in that as well for somebody else in the recycling yes. and the shipping off Ireland. <clears throat> and we see that China's closing its doors to the material as other countries suddenly had enough of it. Um, should we, with, a, with an incinerator like we've got, should we burn it uh, instead of trying to recycle it? In fact, it does produce a huge amount of heat. It does. Um, there is an argument for that. I'm not really sure which way to go on that because I, th I think maybe uh, this is where companies are looking at this now because there is so much waste. They're looking at how can you actually turn it into money. That's mm. a sad reflection on the world, but that is what they're thinking. And I think you'll find that there's quite a lot of people working on all sorts of clever ideas at the moment. Um, should we burn it? I suppose if we're making electricity from it, okay. Mm. 
but I'm not really 100% behind that. For our terms, there's quite a shipping cost. to There is a huge cost, yeah. Well, the news, weather and sport will be with us in a few minutes, so there we'll end today's Sunday Opinion. Our studio guest is Bill Dale, BEM, and he's the founder and organiser of the charity FIM Capital Beach Buddies, which, with the help of thousands of volunteers, works to keep our beaches and rivers, you heard, free from the effects of pollution. We've been discussing the work of beach buddies and also the wider implications of plastic in the oceans, and we'll come back to that topic later. Bill will be back with us at quarter past one for this week's Man in Line, that's Manx Radio's phone-in programme, so if you'd like to make a contribution to the debate, then telephone us on 66 13 68. You may also text to 166 177 or email to studio at manxradio.com. Catherine Nicholl was the producer, I'm Roger Watterson, and we all look forward to your company at one fifteen.